right, in this video we're going to look at evaluating some double integrals. We'll talk about a theorem and a strategy and go through an example. So there are two things that you need to think about before you really dig into evaluating the double integral. One of them is the region that you're integrating over and the other is about the function that you're integrating. And so it doesn't really matter which of those things you kind of start with, it's just important that you think about both of these two things before you do your double integral. So I've got two pictures here of two different kinds of regions. In this first region, some texts call X simple. Our textbook does not use that language, but a lot of other textbooks do. And then the second region is called Y simple. And some regions are both and some regions are neither. So we need to decide what kind of region we have that we're working with. For an X simple region, the reason we would call that X simple is that when you go through the region in the direction of increasing X, so I've drawn a lot of arrows through the region here in the direction of increasing X, it's important that you think about completely through the region and not just one pass through the region here. But when you go through that region in the direction of increasing X, you're always entering through the same curve that's over here on the left side. I'm going to give that curve a name here. So I'm going to call that one x as a function of y, x equals g of y. And then you're always exiting through the same curve. And so we'll also give that curve a name. So this region is called x simple because you always enter the region through x equals g of y and leave through x equals h of y. The next region is called y simple because when you go through that region in the direction of increasing y, and again, you want to think about the whole region, including the ends here, not just uh, one pass through the region, you're always entering through the same curve. So that would be y equals some function of x, I'll call that g of x. And then you're leaving always on this one through the same curve, we'll call that curve that you're leaving through y equals h of x. Okay, so you need to classify what kind of region you have. And then the other thing to think about is the function that you're integrating. And you want to think about is that function easier to integrate with respect to one variable than the other. Okay, so I'm going to put an example over here and we'll kind of go through that example as we talk through the ideas here. So I've added an example to the screen here. So we're going to evaluate a double integral of a function. The function we're integrating is this xy. So our function is f of xy equals xy and we're integrating that over our region R here shown in the picture. So the two things we need to think about, the function and the region, I'm going to start by thinking about the region. So if I think about going through this region in the direction of increasing X, I just think about going all the way through this region in the direction of increasing X, I'm always entering through this Y equals square root of X function and then I'm always leaving through the y equals square root of 2 minus x function. So this region is x simple. The region, however, is not y simple. If you think about going through the region in the direction of increasing y, then there are two different places where you enter that region. Sometimes you enter the region through the x-axis between x equals 0 and x equals 3, and sometimes you enter that region through the curve y equals square root 2 minus x. So this region is not y simple. Our function is the other thing to think about. Uh, is x times y, and if I integrate that with respect to x, so sort of just like you think about differentiating with respect to x or y, but in this case antiderivative with respect to x or y, that function is pretty easy to find an antiderivative of with respect to x or y. Okay, um, so the next thing to think about is uh, a theorem, an important theorem. So I'm going to scroll up here so that we can look at this theorem. This theorem basically tells us how to set up limits of integration. It's called Fubini's theorem. There's a weaker form and a stronger form. We're just going to look at the stronger form here. Uh, it says that if our function that we're integrating is continuous on our region R, so we'll need to verify that that's true for the example we're looking at, and R is X simple, then and then there's a part here that I'm going to go ahead and fill in. It tells us that we can basically set this up as what's called an iterated integral. And so that's an integral within an integral. So I'm going to use some brackets here to set off one integral inside another integral. And on the inner integral, if I have an x simple region, on the inner integral, my x limits of integration are going to be those curves where we enter and leave. And so if I scroll up here and look at the picture, we labeled the curve where we entered an x simple region as g of y 
and where we leave as h of y of our function that we are integrating, our f of x, y, and that inner differential then will be dx. So note here that if I've got a differential with respect to x, that my limits of integration are x equals and x equals. And this is an iterated integral because I have an integral within an integral here. And on the outer integral, I'll have y limits of integration, a dy differential and y limits of integration. I'm going to go back up here to the picture and label what those y values would be. One way to think about that is if you have an x simple region and you go through the region in the direction of increasing x and then you collapse that region back onto the y axis. So you look at the shadow of that region back onto the y axis and look at where that region is on the y axis get this interval here on the y-axis. I'm going to go ahead and give those some labels and we'll call that lower y value y equals c and the upper y value y equals d. So our y limits of integration here would go from y equals c to y equals d. And again, the outer differential here is in terms of y, so these values here should be given in terms of y. And then if I have a y simple region, I'm going to go ahead and put the inner integral in terms of y. So y equals g of x to y equals h of x. Those would be the curves where you enter and you leave. And then the outer integral, the dx, would be the x constants where we have the shadow on the x-axis. So if I look at the picture here, we would be looking at when I enter, I enter along y equals g of x and I leave through y equals h of x and then the shadow down onto the x-axis would be this interval from x equals a to x equals b. All right, there's one other condition here on this Fubini's theorem, which I didn't type here, and the other condition is that those g of y and h of y and g of x and h of x functions are all continuous on those intervals. All right, and then the last thing to think about here is that we're going to use partial integration and the fundamental theorem of calculus. So this is essentially just going back to calculus one. Uh, the key thing is that you want to just start on the inner integral. One important thing to notice about Fubini's theorem here is that these outer limits of integration are always constants. Sometimes I get students who try to put functions on their outer limits of integration, but those should always be constants. Your function equations are going to go on your inner limits of integration. Okay, let's scroll up here and look at the example that we were working on and we'll go ahead and set up that integral and do that integration. All right, we decided that this region was x simple, but not y simple. So we will want to set this integral up with dx on the inner integral. So I usually set up my inner integral first, and I usually write x equals and x equals to remind myself that these need to be x equals equations. When I enter this region, I'm entering along this parabola here, which is labeled y equals square root of x. So I need to convert that to be in terms of x. So that'll be y squared equals x if I just square both sides there. So x equals y squared is where we enter the region. And then the equation for the other side, where I leave when I go through in the direction of increasing x, I need to, again, solve that for x. So there's a couple steps of algebra to do there. y squared plus 6 all over 2 is one way you can write that. My function that I'm integrating is xy. That function is continuous everywhere, and this inner integral is a dx integral because I have an x simple region. And then my outer integral will be dy. My dy integral, I need to figure out if I project this region back onto the y axis, what are the y values at the top and the bottom? And so if we go back here to the y-axis and look at that interval from wherever this bottom part is at, that's at y equals zero, to whatever the y-coordinate of this intersection point is. So you might have to do a little bit of algebra there to figure out that intersection point. Just solve a little system of equations here, either using the original equations or the ones that I've rewritten in terms of x. You get that that intersection point is six comma square root of six when you do that algebra. So our y values on our integral will go from y equals 0 to y equals square root of 6.
All right, you'll never see your textbook write these x equals x equals and y equals y equals on your integrals. Uh, so it's fine to leave those off. I usually put them on at least for the first few times I do an integral just to remind myself and remind students what is being plugged in for what. All right, so at that point I've used Fubini's theorem to set up my integral and now I just need to finish that using partial integration and the fundamental theorem of calculus. All right, so I'm going to start on the inner integral. These outer integrals should not disappear and reappear. I'm just going to write 0 to square root of 6. I'm going to integrate this inner function with respect to x. I have dx here, so I'm going to integrate with respect to x. So I'm treating y as constant. And so my antiderivative would be 1 half x squared, and then the y just comes along. And I'm going to evaluate that from x equals y squared to x equals, I'm going to go ahead and simplify that so that I have 1 half y squared plus 3. All right, so I've done the inner integral here. I need to then use fundamental theorem of calculus to put those limits of integration in place of x and subtract. Notice that the outer integral, the outer differential, and the outer integral sign did not disappear. Even though I'm just working on the inner integral, those should still be there to have correct notation. I'm going to just scooch down here at the bottom and finish this problem. Okay, so I've got my outer integral still from 0 to square root of 6, and then on the inner integral I'm going to put these limits of integration in place of x. So it's important to remember what you're putting them in place of. That's why writing x equals and x equals can help you so that you don't accidentally put it in place of the wrong thing. Uh, so I'll have 1 half, and then I put in my upper limit of integration first. I'm just doing what fundamental theorem of calculus tells you from Calc 1. So I put that all in place of x. So I have the 1 half y squared plus 3, the whole quantity squared times y, minus 1 half, and then I'll put in the y squared, the lower limit of integration, times y, and then I still need to integrate all of that with respect to y. All right, so depending on what you get at this next step, you just need to kind of think about that and think about you're going to have to do that next integral. Um, I'm going to go ahead and just expand this out and do some simplifying. You could do some u substitution if you prefer. Just to save some space here, I'm going to skip some algebra steps here, but when I expand all that out and simplify, I get negative 3 eighths y to the fifth. Notice I'll have a y to the fifth term from the back end here and a y to the fifth term when I expand all of this out here, plus 3 halves y cubed plus 9 halves y. So I haven't done any calculus yet, I just did some algebra expanding that out and combining like terms. And then let's go ahead and do the integration with respect to y, and then we'll just go ahead and plug in our our limits of integration and simplify our answers. And uh, remembering that I got a positive number here should make sense if we go back up and think about what this integral was asking us to find. Think back to that Riemann sum. The idea is that if I partition this whole region up, pick points, plug them into the function, this is the function I'm integrating, this f of xy equals xy. So when I plug in points that are in this region, these points in this region are all in the first quadrant. When I plug those points into this function, I will always get positive outputs on this region. So I should expect to get a positive number. What that number represents in this case actually is a volume. If I think about the volume, if I think about the volume of the region whose base is the region R and whose top is formed by this function f of xy equals x times y. This one actually turns out to be a volume. Not all double integrals are volume. Remember that if your function outputs are ever negative, then what you have is not really a volume. But in this case, we have a function whose outputs are always positive on the region that we're interested in. So in this case, our answer really actually is a volume.